We're going to go read now uh, chapter 2 of Dr. Oskul's The uh, Mystery of Christ, a, an expose of the Toll House cult because it demonstrates how this Toll House cult uh, impacts on our Orthodox Christian theology. Why did Christ descend from heaven, inquired St. Irenaeus. God became man that humanity could become divine. Quote, we could not otherwise attain to incorruption and immortality unless we had been united with him who is incorrupt and immortal at, against heresies. 34. They are wrong then who teach that the purpose of the incarnation, hence the cross, was merely the abolition of sin. The scripture and the fathers place the idea of life before the idea of sin. Although it was Adam's sin that introduced death, the death of mankind into the world, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, it is death, or corruption, that produces sin in us, and sin loses its venom with the death of death. O death, where is thy sting, sting O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. But until the cross, man was captive of the devil through death and man's fear of it. He ruled man through the forces of sin, the passions. As Lord of the grave, he knew that man would be unable not to sin and unable not to sin and unable not to die. The redemptive work of Christ was dedicated to the death of death, that is, to new life, eternal life, hence releasing man from satanic domination. On the cross, death came to his body, not from himself, but from the hostile councils, in order that whatever death they offer to the Savior, this he might utterly abolish, wrote St. Athanasius the Great in his incarnation of the Word of God, 24.2. The death of death eradicated the devil's dream, quote, For he himself came to bear the curse laid upon us. How else could he have become a curse unless he received the death set by the curse? And thus, when we fulfill the Father's will, he establishes us in co-worship, as co-worshippers with the angels, and the manner of our life manifests our emulation of the heavenly blissfulness. From there he leads us again to the supreme ascent through the divine realities of the Father of light, where he makes us partakers of the divine nature by grace through participation in the Spirit. Therefore we shall be called children of God, and all of us in purity and boundlessness shall serve him wholly. The worker himself of that grace, the Father, Son by nature, from whom, through whom, and in whom we have and shall have being, movement, and life. Um, the Commentary on the Lord's Prayer. In other words, the divine economy involves much more than the forgiveness of sin and the liberation of man from death and the demons. God the Son became incarnate to recover the entire cosmos from them, to recover and transfigure it. Thus on Mount Tabor, Christ was metamorphosed, metamorphosed with the uncreated light from eternity. Hence, with the return of the Savior, will the cosmos become the church, or the kingdom of God. All that exists beyond the cage of hell will become divine. The ontological transfiguration of the heavens has already begun. One of the seven priestly prayers of Vesper states, God who has given us a pledge of the promised kingdom, through the good things already bestowed upon us, has made us to shun all evil. The future is already present, as, Montebor in, in, as the Montebor incident proved. The Lord received this truth 
revealed this truth to us and his words to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. There is no more pregnant word in the Christian vocabulary than today. By baptism, we have already entered paradise, as St. Cyril of Jerusalem once said. By the Eucharist, we have tasted the fruit of the kingdom. The church is the earnest, the figure, the realization of eternal life on earth. She is the anticipation of the kingdom of God to come. Christ is already the father of the age to come, Isaiah 9, 6. The process of our deification has been inaugurated. No wonder Seraphim Masarov called upon all members of the Orthodox Church to acquire the Holy Spirit, who dwells in her as a symbol and by whose grace we are deified. What then is meant then by, for the soul of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them, Wisdom 3, 1. The righteous, i.e., the holy to whom the holy things, the Eucharist, are given, these are the children of God, who are never separated from the love of Christ, not in life, nor in death, nor in the age to come, Romans 8, 35. The righteous are those who are redeemed, are those who are saved. They have remained faithful to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Under what condition were they able to retain their, in, their fidelity? They were released from the slavery to the devil and from death and sin by the grace of his redemption. They have nothing to fear from any of them, having been baptized into his death and resurrection unto the newness of life, for death has no more dominion over them. Romans 6, 4 through 9. Therefore the devil is no menace to the new creature, whose sins have been forgiven by that very cross that dethroned the God of the age. The righteous are the adopted sons of the Father in Christ. What is natural to the Son of God and His Spirit that leads his people, Romans 8, 14 through 17. In the church they share already in the everlasting age to come through the mysteries, especially the Eucharist. The righteous are identified with Christ by virtue of their incorporation into his body, the church. She lies at the heart of the mystery on account of the mystical identity with the groom and his bride. Because of this union, the righteous partake in the life of God even now. The road to paradise and the kingdom has no satanic impediment, for it is the road initiated now in the church and running into eternity. For that reason, John Chrysostom said, Do not separate yourself from the church. Nothing is as powerful as she. The church is your hope, the church your salvation. The church is your refuge. She is mightier than the heavens, higher than the earth. She cannot age, and her vitality is eternal. She is becoming what she is destined to become. The righteous of the earthly church have already foretasted the age to come. One more chapter, and we'll read chapter 3 a little later here in Oxford. And... Uh, as you follow the whole book through, remember you can have the entire text free. But we're going to read this in to the YouTube broadcast. Thank you and God bless you.